All right, so as promised, so this is probably the first video where my desire to share the information and my need to be an entertainer conflict. This one's going to be a little different. It's almost going to be like a live stream. I will be peppering in some of my personal experiences and personal stories with this one. I was supposed to do this with an ex-girlfriend of mine. She is an activist and politically active in the LGBTQ community. Her father is an ex-pastor, and she is a very good friend of mine. We have been friends for over 20 years. We became friends after we dated, just FYI. But for whatever reason, she was not available. Uh, we had been emailing each other about this, um, but it's just going to be me. Uh, the, the, the host of this and I will be talking about um, sexual experiences, alcohol, drugs, uh, dating, adult situations. When I originally started this channel, my original plan was to just cover my wacky and interesting life story document me and my friends hanging out. Obviously, that's not the way this channel went. And I converted in the middle of all of that. So that changed a lot of the content I was willing to put on this channel. I do have other channels where I do put more secular content. But I say that to give you a warning, this is not going to be the usual theological conversations. This is not going to be book analysis. This is not going to be philosophy. We're talking real life experiences here, and she goes hard. And I will, again, pepper in my experiences that either parallel with hers or conflict with hers. So you can get a more well-rounded idea of what a Christian and a Catholic is who is not living a hypocritical lifestyle. That might sound harsh, but this is going to get harsh. This is not going to be an easy video for anyone. I have wanted to make this video in the back of my head since I first started talking about religion, and I have made very many failed attempts to do so. The closest I've been able to do is in my debates with atheists when I'm speaking to someone in the LGBTQ community or someone in the trans community, I'm able to tell my story a little more fueler, a little bit more broader, simply because of certain cultural touchstones that we have in common. This is not a coming out video or anything like that. I, I am actually straight. Sorry, everyone. To disappoint you. But... I, I lived a, uh, a lifestyle that is going to be very well mirrored by both her and then I'm going to do another pastor who's not Catholic at all after this. And my lifestyle and my friends mirror these two individuals almost perfectly, almost exactly. We're going to delve into some really deep psychological and emotional stuff here. This is real Christianity, real Catholicism on the floor. We are looking at where the bodies are buried and where the blood is okay this is for some of you going to be very uncomfortable for me it's going to be very very easy uh, and for those of you who think this makes me not a real christian or you're going to call me the devil or call me satan i really don't care i i've confessed all my sins to god i believe in jesus christ and i'm a member in good standing of the catholic church so i'm not concerned all right let's go let's do this all right i am as ready as i'm ever going to be from her end you're going to be hearing about lesbianism Consider it a trigger warning if you want to. You're going to be hearing about lesbianism, mild drug use, uh, divorce, and adultery. From my end, you're going to be hearing about alcoholism, sex addiction, paganism, Wiccanism, occultism, uh, humanism, and polyamory. You're going to be hearing a lot of terms that a lot of traditional Christians and, and Orthodox Christians don't like hearing nowadays because it becomes so ubiquitous with the woke side of things. But you're going to be hearing about polyamory. You're going to be hearing about pansexuality, bisexuality, and uh, asexuality, believe it or not. And uh, you will be hearing about transgenderism. So we're going to get into this. Let's do it. I am so excited to introduce our speaker today. She is a passionate woman who's an international speaker, and she loves talking about the love and freedom that she's discovered from God in her own life. She loves having relationships with people and really strives to be raw and transparent in order to empower other people to do the same. When you can't find her in her home in Southern California, you could probably find her in her home away from home, Ethiopia, surrounded by her over 280 plus children. Today she's going to be talking us a little bit about the topic of her own journey as well as her struggles with sexuality. It is such an honor and a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Kim Zimber. I want to give my own introduction to her, which is that I think she's doing the best. I don't know if she's Catholic. I think she is. But I think she's doing the best Catholic outreach to the LGBTQ community that's out there on the public stage uh, that's in the big picture. Obviously there's individual people in smaller groups that are doing amazing work. But I think she is the best example. If 
I want to see Trent Horn become anyone I want him to become her when it comes to the way that he speaks on this topic. I don't expect that. I do think he can get to the place where Father Mark Schmidt is. I do think he can get to the place where Bishop Robert Barron is. I don't think he can get to where Father Casey is. I just don't, judging by his last few videos. And I don't think he can get to where she is. But if I had a dream for him, it would be for him to be able to talk, to speak on these topics the way that she speaks to them. Because abortion, divorce, homosexuality, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sex addiction, pornography, these are very important things to address in the Christian realm. And these are active sins, for lack of a better term, active vices is the better word I would use, that are in the Christian life and are in the Catholic life. Priests struggle with this. Apologists struggle with this. Uh, you name the Catholic celebrity, they struggle with these things. So infidelity is a real thing. Fornication is a real thing. We are human. Before anything else, we are human and we are animals. Uh, we we do not deny evolution in the in the United States of Catholicism. So, all right, let's uh, let's hear her go. Okay, I don't hear twenty six thousand claps, which is good because that would have freaked me out. But I am just so honored, truly, to be here. I know that it's not the same. I know that uh, it's a little different, um, but different isn't always bad. And so I am so glad that you're tuning in. I am so glad that you might have not been able to make it in person, but you're here now. Um, and you might be here in six months from now too. So it is just beautiful. Um, and I also just want to put a little disclosure out there that that bio that they read is, is beautiful. But if my like brothers heard it, they'd be like, is that everything though? Because <laughs> it's not. You know, I think in these bios, they, they um, bring up all the good, right? Um, and that really is what God does with us too though. I think so often growing up for me, you know, I grew up Catholic, third grade through eighth grade, private Catholic school, two older brothers. So I was kind of a tomboy, which I, I think I kind of still am, hence the... So uh, on my end, so we can keep it parallel and keep everything copyright friendly. I grew up Catholic as well. I grew up into a Catholic family. My family goes back to being Catholic all the way to uh, Spain. Uh, my family were conversos in Spain. There's actually a name list. You can actually see which one of our family members converted. <laughs> you can see the line and it's Ramon going all the way back. Uh, there's four of us and uh, I come from a much older family. We are Sephardic, we are conversos, and we have been Catholic the entire time in the United States of America. We lost our Jewish identity in the Americas. We went from San Ordis Port to Sea to Laredo from Laredo to Brownsville. I live in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and so all the stories that I'm going to tell, don't imagine a bunch of white kids having these issues. These are all Hispanic people that I'm talking about. Brown eyes, black hair, and uh, with either Hispanic accents or this weird, I don't know where this is from accent. Uh, a lot of us on this side of town have this accent. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> Would we all sound like this? Um, and then on the south side, it's going to be the accent that you think of when you think of uh, Hispanic people and Mexicans, because that's what we are. We're Mexicans. My mother's side is Native American. She's native to the area that I'm from, actually, which is kind of cool. There's some French somewhere in there. I grew up Catholic. Uh, I was raised Catholic. My father and my mother were Catholic. Uh, when I was born, they were dabbling in non-denominationalism. I don't know very much about that. I wasn't there for that. Uh, I just went to church, uh, which was a Catholic parish. After my mom and sister died, things got tenuous and my dad turned the little inheritance that there was into what then was a good amount of money for a teacher. And we came to the nice side of town where my friends became very white. Blonde hair, blue eyed, you, you, you kind of get the idea. Not everyone, but it's just, uh, it was a, a difference to see People that looked like me now to see more people that looked like what you'd see on TV at that time. So um, it was kind of cool. It was interesting. Uh, so a little uh, Anglo al al alcove, alcove, little Anglo alcove in the middle of uh, of a sea of Hispanicism, of Mexicanism, of Latin. And uh, so in my neighborhood, I got a good exposure to different faiths, whether it's uh, Islam, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, um, because. This neighborhood had different people from different areas of America living in it. Uh, I got to witness different religions and different cultures very early on. And so Hinduism, uh, Islam, Baptists, I even, it was even two Buddhists in, in this area as well. So I got to experience all of that as a kid. Yeah, let's uh, keep going. The camo and the converse, but... And uh, when it comes to my attraction, I've always been attracted to what they used to call tomboys. 
my very first girlfriend, my very first crush, who was also my first girlfriend, was this beautiful female in a leather jacket with short hair. And she helped me because I was getting beat up <laughs> and she beat the crap out of the two guys that were beating me up. I was a wimpy kid. I guess you'd call it a sissy. Um, although I never thought of myself as a sissy. I liked doing adventurous guy things. I liked jumping roofs. I liked jumping fences. I liked doing all that stuff. I liked skateboarding. I like uh, bicycle riding. But yeah, I, I, I was a sissy. I was a wimp. And my girlfriends were tougher than me. Like I said, and I liked the tough girls. I liked the bad girls. The girls that smoked. The girls that had short hair, leather jackets, that had a lot of attitude. You know, that kind of thing. Like I said, this these are my friends growing up, but you know, this type of person. I don't really understand what tomboy means anyways. I always thought Tom was a boy, but that is, uh, that is still to be discovered. So anyways, uh, just growing up for me, you know, I just kind of always wanted to be like my brothers. And uh, I still kind of do actually in a way. They're, they're amazing men. Um, but as a girl, I remember thinking it was a little bit different. You know, for me, I didn't have the same desires that a lot of my friends had, especially when I started getting into junior high. All my friends started having crushes on boys and I was more friends with boys. I saw him more as my brother than anything other than that. So funny, I was girl crazy from the moment I was like six years old. The moment I knew what a girl was, I loved women just in general. Wasn't good at liking them. Wasn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't have any skill. I, in fact, when I got older, I was completely scared of them. But we'll get to that when she gets to her part of her story that parallels that. I remember when I was young, like... I started, well, it was actually even way back when my friends in like third and fourth grade were talking about what they were gonna, what they were gonna wear when they got married, all the colors of their wedding, all these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I had no desire whatsoever um, to even think about a dress, let alone a I was a normal kid until my mom died, uh, just put it bluntly. Once my mom died, I became obsessed with ghosts and the occult and magic. And I read every book I could find, every non-fiction books actually when i learned the difference between fiction and non-fiction i went to every non-fiction book i could find on ghost i went to different libraries different bookstores like whatever i could find for years like just rummaging through the occult section that's actually through that journey is how i discovered ghosts aren't real magic wasn't real that all of this was invented in the 1960s or 1950s alistair crowley you name the occult figure and i can tell you their history and i know about them and i read about them it's mostly just LSD induced BS. And so I just stopped believing in the supernatural almost altogether by the time I was, let's say, 14. But from the age of six, that's when my mom died, up to the age of 13, I was obsessed with ghosts, with vampires, with witches, and I read everything I could on them. And I, I, I kept studying with them even after I didn't believe those things were real. I, I just wanted to gather more and more knowledge of them. I was the weird kid. I went from being the wimpy, sissy kid to being the weird kid. And I changed neighborhoods, so all my friend, my friend group completely changed, and I became the outsider. Well, you can guess how that went. Okay. A wedding dress. And so I remember when I was younger thinking something was maybe a little bit different with me. I didn't really give it much thought. People didn't really unpack it too much, and I didn't really talk about it either. And so I'm going to pause for a second, though, and just break into something real quick, because... Tonight, today, wherever you are, whatever time it is, um, I'm going to share with you a part of my heart that isn't easy, but I know the Lord has healed and is continuing to heal in my own life. Um, and that has to do with homosexuality. And so, like I said, you know, growing up, always felt a little different, didn't know quite what that meant. And growing up with God in my life, it was a little bit hard when I came into my high school years and started to realize I actually had physical attraction to women. So through my study of esoteric occultism, for lack of a better word, I also got into the study of sexuality. So I got my hands in the nonfiction section. Uh, I got my hands on a lot of books about sex and sexuality. So, so I identified as pansexual really early on, in like 12 or 13. I, I gave myself that label. And this is not nowadays where this are acceptable practices. Uh, this is in the 90s when this was not acceptable. So I you can imagine going from being a sissy to being the weird kid to now being the person who's out and talking about being pansexual. It did not go well. I was friends with out people. Nobody really identifies with anything. I was just an idiot who decided to give myself a label because I was friends with people who uh, were marginalized, whether uh, in our community because they were uh, black and they there was only three black kids in our school or because they were gay and nobody gave them that label, but they were, you know, 
gay, or they were lesbian, or they were bisexual, or they were tomboys. That's who I hung out with. I liked the tomboys. I didn't understand that most of the tomboys were lesbians. I didn't get that. So I hung out with tomboys. So I hung out with their friends, and their friends became my friends, and you can get the rest. I saw a girl with short hair and a leather jacket, or sunglasses, or smoking an awesome <laughs> cigarette in a really badass way, or getting into a fight. I wanted to meet her. I wanted to talk to her. So there you go. And I was really influenced by Madonna uh, and uh, a few other people like Tristan Terrasmino and oh, the author of Opening Up. I can't remember her name anymore, but she used to have a podcast that I listened to for a very long time. Anyway, they wrote these books in the 90s uh, and in the early 2000s. And uh, these books and these people were famous. They were actually, some of these people would actually be in the first few episodes of Real Sex. If you remember what that was. And so I consumed all that stuff. Like I was just a degenerate. And uh, yeah, so we're doing this. We're having this conversation. Let's keep going. I think there was some confusion in that for me personally, because I was really drawn to certain women, whether it be, you know, friends or whatever, or a, or a particular girl, but I liked who they were. I was usually drawn to women that were the opposite of me. I'm, I was kind of like just crazy. And so I was drawn to the more meek, humble. I was not necessarily humble. I, I still, the Lord, I'm a work in progress, but in that, I, it, it didn't start off as a physical attraction. I could tell. Let me give you a kind of a breakdown of my dating prowess. It's just not good. It's not. It's not a good. I was. I was. I was terrible uh, around women. I, 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 would, I would chicken out. You want me to jump a rooftop? I could have done it. You want me to jump into a hole and, and find a way out? And I, I did that a few times. You want me to go on an adventure and get lost? Fine. You want me to talk to a girl who I think is absolutely beautiful and stunning and just complete lockup, man. I was so scared. But now I know this because you identify, uh, for males, we identify the female with nature. So a rejection by the female would be a rejection by nature, saying that you're not good enough to survive, you know. You need to procreate and all that. I didn't have any of that in my mind. I just had beautiful girl, like, go, talk. And then I couldn't get any, <laughs> couldn't get words out. But I liked, you know, the girls that I liked wore uh, muscle shirts to school, uh, had weird hair. And this is weird hair back before weird hair was acceptable. You know, they're, they're kind of a flashback to the 70s or, or, or the 80s. And they were troublemakers. Uh, my first girlfriend out of high school I was dating a witch, legitimate. Actually, I dated two witches almost back to back. I, I dated someone who's a bruja, that's a, a kind of witch in the Hispanic community. And then I dated a girl who's identified as Wiccan. And but so when I say date, I mean date. I don't mean like half sex. I don't mean like, like anything. I just mean we dated. And uh, we go to this party and I'm here with the girl that I'm dating. And I see this beautiful, tall redhead. And I found out later that she had either a failed porn career or a failed attempt at porn whatever if she did anything in the business it was maybe only one or two videos but for me at that time that wasn't a turn off so i was dating uh, strippers this is in my late teens early 20s i'm dating strippers i'm dating people who have been in the industry or wanted to be in the industry i was dating models and i was I, I was completely inept at being a partner or being reliable in any kind of way to anyone. There's this one time, this girl I've been chasing after forever. I finally get a shot and I don't take it, but I, I, we stay together and we fall asleep together for the night. Again, no sex, no nothing. I wake up at six in the morning and I'm right next to her and I panic. I'm like, oh crap, she's going to want a relationship. So like, I got to get out of there. Anyway, the point being, I'm a degenerate. I'm an idiot. Uh, and there's no other way to say it. So for the religious people out there, sorry, I'm an asshole. Uh, I'm just, it's, it's, it's not, it's not working out for me. And uh, I left religion at 13. I'll get into that. When she gets into her stuff, I'll explain my stuff. Let's go. That, that the people were beautiful, that these women were beautiful, but it wasn't like this sexual drive. And I'm also going to give a little disclosure for those who maybe don't like to talk real. I would just shut the thing right now because I don't know how else to be. I don't think there's anywhere else and any way else that we should actually share so for me, I'm going to just unpack some things, like I said, that are tough, but I wish that someone would have talked about them personally when I was in high school, when I was the college age and young adult, because I think life would have been a little different. It was my senior year in high school was the very first time I ever acted on my desire for a woman. And if somebody would have stopped me in that moment and said, Kim, before you do this, before you do this, I just want you to know it's going to change your entire life. I would have been like, oh my gosh, my friends are drinking almost every night. They're doing drugs. One of my friends was pregnant her senior year in high school. I'm like, 
it doesn't really matter. See, I was craving intimacy. I think that we all are. We were created for intimacy. And I was craving it. And when I was dating guys, I found that it was really hard for me to be intimate with them without going all the way. Like every single one of the guys that I did, not that there was tons, but there was a good amount and they all wanted to have sex. And so that is the most true statement I've ever heard anyone say about anything when it comes to that period of, of life. So when I moved to this new neighborhood, back to when I was a kid, it was a few years after my, my mother had died and my sister had died. And they made me, I have the photo still, I keep it as a memory of how cruel people can be. The teacher made me take a photo for Mother's Day. I couldn't get out of it. So I, this is actually the first time I ever wore all black. Now I almost always wear all black. I was really into Beetlejuice at the time. <laughs> anyway, so she said that we had to take this photo and I said, I'm not going to do it. So I purposely didn't fix my hair. And I had this like cool Afro thing going on and I'm dressed in all black and I'm like, I'm not going to do it. And she goes, well, why won't you do it? And I'm like, well, because my mother's dead. Why would I do this? She made me take the photo anyway. And I'm miserable in this photo, man. It's just miserable. Yeah, and I'm this little skinny, wimpy kid. So the very next day, I come back to school dressed normally again, feeling pretty down. And I, I miss going back to class. I don't know why. I, I do. I just do. Anyway, sooner or later, three kids come up to me and say, hey, we heard about what you said in your class. Take it back. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Well, we went to our parents and our parents said you're a liar because they said parents don't die. I didn't take it back. I got beat up so bad I ended up in the hospital that because uh, my heart had stopped. That was the last day I was a wimp or a sissy in any kind of way. When I came to, after an outer body experience, the doctor and my dad had a conversation. They said, look, this isn't legal advice, but we're all small guys. You have to learn how to defend yourself. You have to learn how to fight back. Next time someone does something, you fight back. I go back to school the next day and a friend of mine, a friend, uh, pushes me. In a, in a not not even in a, an angry way, he's just he just pushes me. So I grab a cone uh, that's next to me and I beat him up. <laughs> that's the first time I ever beat someone up, and it was my friend. I, there are other stories of me getting into like skirmishes uh, when I was younger, especially because I was wimpy. But that was really my first fight. A anything else was just instinctual, you know, regular rough housing as a kid. But this was my first fight, and and I was the bad guy. Uh, I got beat up the day before, and then I took that aggression out on someone who didn't deserve it. So now I have no friends. And I'm the guy who has a dead mom and a dead sister. <laughs> that went well. And yet still, there was this weird girl with a leather jacket and red hair who liked me. So I got, by the time that I was in junior high, I was a complete drunk. I found alcohol. That was my escapism. And I started to drink all the time. Before school, during school, after school, I didn't sleep at all. And I was just drunk all the time. Yeah. After a summer of cocooning where I just, I wished that things were better. After I got my heart broken for the first time, I came back to school with these huge muscles. Testosterone had hidden. I couldn't be picked on anymore. And I could beat people up at will. Uh, and I did. I uh, beat up my bullies. That was the first thing I did with the new muscles. Uh, and the, the second thing I did was show off. And of course that with the muscles, even with the dandruff and the weirdness and the dead mom and the obsession with ghosts and vampires, some girls still like me for some reason. I don't know. And uh, by the time I get to high school and I'm now defending the kids being picked on, I, I, I get a reputation and uh, people like me for some unknown reason. So I end up partying out uh, with a group of beautiful girls and of course their boyfriends. And we end up throwing parties and out in the the boondocks uh, and eventually those parties get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger mind you i still can't get a girlfriend to save my life the girl comes to me she likes me i don't i can't put two and two together i don't know how to do anything i i, I was so bad at this before i got i figured it i was i was pretty bad i, I was not that elegant I, I was not i was not smooth and i was not a good boyfriend when i was a boyfriend so we get to uh, my junior and senior year in high school. I have a car. We're partying. We're drinking all the time. All we're doing is drinking. The girls are, are the girls that I'm hanging out with are just sleeping with everybody. Not with me. They're not sleeping with me, but they're sleeping with everyone else. And this is the group that I'm hanging out with. Over-sexualized. There's a lot of drugs involved. I'm not doing any of the drugs. I don't know why, but I just decided to stay in the straight and narrow because of an advice of an uncle. But I'm drunk all the time. We're drinking all the time. Uh, and we do this all the way till 21. And the group goes from being like five or seven of us all the way up to 235 people. We have these huge parties. And eventually, I realized for the first time that that was a mistake. We'll get to that when she gets to hers. 
And so for me, you know, growing up in the faith, I was like, you know what, I think God actually got that right. That premarital sex was something that really was not good for me or the other person, and that it was something preserved for marriage. And so it was kind of hard for me in high school to date, at least guys, because I felt like it got to a certain point and then we had to break up because I wasn't willing to sleep with them. Not saying that that was okay for me to now jump over to women, but it is what I did. I was craving intimacy. And see, the thing that I'm continuing to learn is that if you're hungry, you're gonna feed on something, right? So I had this desire for intimacy. I had this desire for closeness. And I think our world has taken intimacy and said that it's sexual, right? We've, we've sexualized everything. And so for me, when I had this draw to this girl that was a good friend of mine, I, I instantly thought, well, this is sexual. Around the time, um, my senior year, uh, this song had come out um, from Katy Perry, God bless her. But it was, I kissed a girl and I liked it. And so there was a lot of things going on in my mind. I think me and her are actually the same age, just that's roughly the same time period I'm talking about. Yeah. So like I said, my first girlfriend out of high school was someone who had been in porn. Uh, my, the girl who I was pursuing, the one who I told you who I, I we fell asleep together and I freaked out and ran. <laughs> I was like, no relationship. Shit. So she was a, a dancer or an ex dancer. I don't know. Exotic dancer. And uh, my next few girlfriends after that would all be uh, dancers or someone in the industry. And, and that would be the case until I was about 24. So from, I would say I, I started drinking at 13. Uh, I got sober sometime around, sometime around never. I, I told myself I got sober around 18. Uh, but really from 18 to 22, uh, me and my friends were just drunk and partying all the time. At 22 is when I went to college uh, and I stopped uh, drinking as much because I had to study. At least I told myself I had to study. But yeah, the, the girls actually would cycle out faster than the guys in the group. The guys would just keep going. Unfortunately, pathetically, at least two of them are still in that lifestyle today. We're talking about, you know, 20 years later, there's at least two of these people that are still in that lifestyle. Uh, the guys, uh, the girls, I think there's one and, and her life didn't go too well. She ended up in jail. But the girls wouldn't last very long because they would get pregnant. So you you would maybe you'd cycle through the girls every six months, every every year. There'd be a, a new, you get like a new girl in the middle of it, and then one of the girls would leave, and then you get another new girl, and like that. Uh, and like I said, this is from uh, the age of sixteen to the age of twenty-two. That was my lifestyle. And uh, like I said, it started off as a very small niche group of, of losers who thought they were cool. And then it became a very large group of party people. And like all groups like that, everyone burned out or washed out. That, that was not the end of my partying days. I kind of partied up all the way till 25. But we'll, we'll get to that. Not blaming that. I don't blame Katie. Uh, I take responsibility for my own choices. But it was my senior year in high school and I acted on the desire I had. I think it's really important. It was around, I guess around 24 that I uh, stopped identifying as pansexual and just identified as straight. I looked at my history of my dating and realized that I was just dating women. And so, and I was only attracted to femininity. So I, I dropped that signifier and, or that identifier, whatever you want to call it. And my life was better for it, to be honest with you. Less explanation, doors would open just by simply dropping an identifier that wasn't really applicable to my lifestyle. Important to note that I had zero physical, emotional, spiritual abuse, at least that I'm aware of or my family's aware of. I, I don't understand looking back on my past and my childhood, why those desires or feelings would have ever come. I was not, you know, I, I know a lot of my friends, women and men struggle with pornography. That was not something I struggled with. I have always... And pornography, if you want to call it a struggle, it's something I still struggle with today. It's not really a temptation. It's more of a habit at this point. And porn for porn's sake is not something I'm interested in anymore. So, you know, I'm not exactly going to the old websites. I'm just, you know, still like looking at beautiful women. Uh, so strip clubs uh, used to be a real problem for me. Uh, they're not anymore. Uh, since I got married, I, I really haven't been hitting the strip club. I can't say I've never faltered. Always love people. I, I just enjoy meeting new people. And so when this girl came in, I was just really drawn to her. Like I said, she was the opposite of me. And I took it to a different level. I was craving intimacy and I went for it with her. And I will tell you, that night changed my life forever. Absolutely. You could tell that I'm not fresh out of high school. Um, and so there's... The redhead I talked to about, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't good at talking to women. I wasn't, wasn't brave. Man, she was amazing. 
And the first time I saw her, I, I chickened out. And the second time I saw her, she approached me and we went on this amazing date. The Maybe the very next day or the next two days, I forget now. And there was this moment where I could have said no, where she told me her history. She told me her past. She told me who she was. She told me exactly what she was into, all her bad habits, everything. And I could have said no. But my desire to not be alone, my desire for intimacy, as she's saying, but my desire, my just the male teenage horniness, I guess, uh, overtook me. And I, I gave in to all of her insanity. She liked what she liked tarot cards and other kind of stuff so we did Terra. you know she liked blasphemous music uh, so i got into blasphemous music uh she liked risque adventures so we got into that and, and this would be a pattern with me is that i would be attracted to these dangerous women but beautiful women femme fatales is what they would be identified in in literature and uh, i would pick up another bad habit from each one I was literally dating the wrong person, almost on purpose. So uh, I would read everything from the Satanic Bible to the Witch's Magical Handbook. Even after I knew all of it was BS, I, I still would indulge whatever their indulgence was to have these, I was going to say successful, but to have these powerful women be in my life. I was willing to compromise my internal sense of morality because I didn't really have an internal compass. And I was willing to compromise because I didn't want to be alone. It's been years in between, years in between since that one kiss. I would have never believed that one kiss would have changed my life, the direction. And, and you know what it did actually for me? You know, people could say like, hey, I have a craving for this or I, I want this. Well, you can't have a craving for something, in my opinion. You can't have a craving for something unless you've tasted it. You can think that something might sound really good and you might, you might desire it, but to actually crave it, you've had to taste it. And so that my senior year in high school, when I kissed that girl, there was now a craving. She didn't kiss. I don't know if that's true, but that's an interesting take. Me or my boyfriends that I had dated didn't kiss me like she did. And, and I'm sorry if that maybe makes some of you uncomfortable, but it's just real. And, it, and it's, it was my life. And so now I wanted I started to actually see women differently after that one kiss. Now, when I saw a beautiful woman, my mind went to something physical instead of just appreciating beauty, right? Like I can see a dog and find the dog beautiful, but not have the desire to be with the dog. But now because I did something with this girl, I was starting to see women in a different light. I'm not going to unpack everything that I went through, but I will say I never told a soul. I never told anyone. She didn't want to continue anything with me, uh, which actually broke me to an even, an even deeper level. You know, it's funny on, on the secrecy thing. I, I never talked about any of this until I was in college with a group of my, my, still my best friend to this day and one of his close friends. It's the first time I ever talked about it. And then I didn't talk about it regularly. Even with the people who I was involved with in these situations, we didn't talk about it until... I started doing debates, and they would bring up homosexuality and, and the Catholic Church's attitude towards sex, human sexuality in general. I used to write for a deconstructionist feminist magazine. I did that in early college, and I did it to impress these destructive women. I was just, I was just trying to, I don't know. My life was just a mess, and I was attracted to. We have a flower here called the Ponsignetta, and it's 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 incredibly poisonous, but it's incredibly beautiful. And, and that's where I was at in my life. I was attracted to the beautiful but dangerous, and and I thought, well, but they wouldn't turn on me. They that this poison wouldn't wouldn't hit me. You know, they're my friends. I was so wrong about that. But you you start feeling immune, and you start feeling invincible. And life has a way. For me, it was a cancer scare. And then later on, diabetic diabetic health situation. Life has a way of of just saying, no, you're not invincible. Let me show you. Our friendship was over. Uh, it was a, it was a one-time thing. So now I was left with this desire and this craving, and now my friend was also gone. So that was really hard to deal with, and I didn't want to go talk to my family. I didn't want to talk to anyone. One, I didn't want to be labeled as gay. Two, I didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to just pretend like the feelings for women would go away. I wanted to pretend that if, or I wanted to believe rather, that if I just didn't think about it, it would all stop. And that was actually the opposite of what happened. So for years, for years, I was dating guys on the forefront and behind the scenes being with women. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't a physical thing for me always. I loved 
the relationship. I love that another woman could understand how I felt. She didn't think I over-talked. You know, all the things that sometimes guys are like zoning off, you know, it, it was just different. And then you add the intimacy of a kiss or whatever else it might be, and now that bond, what I thought was growing us even closer, but it was actually just carving a deeper hole in my heart. Okay, only 10 minutes in. Okay, we're gonna cut back here and we'll do this. We'll do another installment.